פרופסור בב ליבר, he's a professor of government and international affairs at Georgetown University, where he chairs the executive committee of the program of for Jewish civilization, and has previously served as chair of the government department, and inter -chair, interim chair uh, of the department of psychology. There are many stories about it, uh, which we don't have time to tell now. Uh, he's author and editor of 16 books on international relations and U.S. foreign policy. He's been advisor to several presidential campaigns, to the State Department, to the drafters of the U.S. national intelligence estimates. His latest book, Power and Willpower in American Future, was been published by Cambridge University Press and deals precisely with this question. Bob, it's your floor. He's also a founding member of the academic board of uh, International Academic Board of BESA and a good friend, Bob. Thank you very much, Ephraim. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And let me congratulate um, you for the extraordinary role you've played at the BESA Center. Institutional creation is a, um, an enormous task. Most institutions that people try to start either fail to achieve their objectives um, or uh, fall far short of them, I think. Uh, you have exceeded expectations and made this uh, BESA Center the outstanding outfit of its kind in Israel. Also, the achievements of Bar Ilan University since its inception are extraordinary as well. Let me turn, however, in the short time available to me to the uh, subject that I've been given. The title is, America Has the Power, Does It Have the Will? The idea of decline uh, about the role of America, about its capacity and its will, is widespread, uh, not only abroad, but at home. Uh, just before coming to Israel, I went to Google, as you can do. I typed in the words, decline of America, and it produced 135 million hits. The Chinese think America is in decline. The Pew Foundation surveyed uh, 39 countries and more than two thirds of their populations share that idea. 64% uh, of the, the United States population think that the United States is on the wrong track. And the decline idea is widely expressed by authors, pundits, public intellectuals, political officials, scribblers, and the transatlantic chattering classes. Um, and the objects of that concern include not only our economy, but education, society, foreign policy elites. And Tom Friedman of the New York Times writes ominously that the escalators at the Bethesda Metro, Metro don't work well. The, um, uh, even the comic book character Superman last year gave up his American citizenship. So we would seem to be in bad shape. Um, but I can note that more thoughtful observers than some of those I've uh, already cited, including the author of Superman, have also warned about America. Henry Kissinger, for whom I have great respect, a former professor of mine, uh, has written, and I quote, the US cannot afford another decline like that which has characterized the past decade and a half. Only self-delusion can keep us from admitting our decline to ourselves. Very sober and thoughtful and ominous words from Henry Kissinger. Just one problem. He wrote those words 52 years ago uh, in 1961 in his book, The Necessity for Choice. Now, Kissinger is a wise man, but it suggests that much of the discourse about American decline has been exaggerated, hyperbolic, and ahistorical. Let me give you one more example from a leading Japanese thinker and public intellectual. I'm just back from two weeks in to at the University of Tokyo this summer, and I appreciate what the Japanese have achieved in so many spheres. Well. Uh, Akio Morita, the co-founder of Sony, and a uh, colleague of his, a leading Japanese politician, wrote in a widely circulated 1989 book, The Japan That Can Say No, the words, quote, 
we are going to have a totally new configuration in the balance of power in the world. There is no hope for the United States. That was written in 1989. So, um, as you can tell, I'm somewhat skeptical about these uh, uh, proclamations, but why the recurrent pessimism? How do we separate out what's real and what's exaggerated? First, I think there is an overemphasis on short-term and uh, temporary material factors. Second, there is an overreaction to adversity. We face serious problems at home, as well as serious problems abroad, but we have always faced serious problems at home and abroad. Think of that Kissinger quote. The impact of two long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, among the longest wars in American history, have sapped uh, popular support for military intervention, even though our casualties at 6,700 dead, while painful, pale in comparison to America's size and past overseas conflicts. Our economic recovery is continuing, but it's not at the pace that we would like or have had in the past. And the rise of China is sometimes pointed to ominously as the, that of a new superpower, which will soon overtake the United States in every realm. Domestically, um, the costs of entitlement programs, that is pensions and health care, are a huge issue, as have been the deficits and uh, debt and so forth. And even more importantly, political polarization, including the current um, uh, fight in Congress, first the sequester and now the shutdown of government, which I would describe as government by temper tantrum. These are serious matters, but I think when we step back, we can say that the declinist discourse is typically ahistorical and fails to take the longer view. An example of this, and since we're at a university, the most serious intellectual basis for the decline argument has been articulated by Paul Kennedy, a diplomatic historian, formerly in Britain, now at Yale, who wrote a best-selling book 25 years ago about the rise and decline of great powers. He argued, as have some others before him, that a great or superpower rises and then declines because of, quote, imperial overstretch. That is, that a country's commitments, especially abroad, eventually over exceed its capacities, and that excess ultimately brings down that country. He has, of course, in mind not only uh, the great European powers and previous empires, but above all, the experience of Great Britain. Sounds persuasive. The problem is that exactly 100 years ago, on the eve of World War I, Britain had already been, even though it was said the sun never set on the British Empire, the Brits controlled a quarter of the world's surface and population, they dominated in, in all kinds of fields, even by then Britain had been overtaken by two or three other powers. They were already number three in military spending, number three in industrial production, the U.S. far ahead, Germany uh, had edged ahead, and they were number four in gross domestic product. In contrast, if you use material indicators such as those, the American material lead compared to other actors still remains enormous and unparalleled. In the interest of time, I'll touch on just a few points as evidence. The um, uh, size, breadth, and depth of America's economy and financial markets is unique. Despite the economic crisis that affected uh, the U.S. and much of the world in 2008 and the subsequent years, the U.S. still represents 60% of the world's reserve currencies, 85% of global financial transactions are still in dollars. According to The Economist magazine last month, Nine out of the ten most valuable companies in the world are American companies. 
Our budget deficit, which had approached 10% of GDP just a few years ago, is rapidly falling. This fiscal year, it's down to 3.7%. Our um, defense budget, which is often pointed to as uh, draining us, um, and which peaked at 5% of GDP a few years back during the height of the Iraq and Afghan wars, the share of defense as a part of GDP uh, is down this fiscal year to 3.6%. By his, that's a lot of money in dollars. A uh, hundred, that $600 billion is real money, however you count it. But in the 1950s, we were in double digits. Uh, in the 60s, we averaged 8.7%. In the 70s and 80s, over 6% of GDP. There is nothing intrinsic that shows that America cannot afford to sustain a very substantial military as we do now. In other words, we have the capacity for guns and butter. We have great universities. Every table or assessment of the great world universities inevitably shows that America's great research universities uh, have a disproportionately large share of those. A footnote, I note with some um, pleasure that Israeli universities uh, are now uh, nicely represented in that table. Obviously not to the same number of the US given the difference in size, but it reflects an achievement you can be proud of. American research and development, science, Nobel Prize winners, high tech, innovative capacity. Um, the, uh, in fields that are going to dominate in the coming generation, America has leads in almost all of them. Artificial intelligence, advanced computing, three-dimensional printing, robotics, nanotechnology, biotechnology, medical research and development, uh, advanced machinery, entertainment, uh, all of which, by the way, are products to meet the demands of a burgeoning world middle class between one and two billion people in the world who've moved into middle class status in the last generation. America has the third largest population in the world after China and India, and our population is growing and will be growing, 315 million as I speak. We have a favorable fertility rate. We have enormous land mass, geography, and agricultural resources. Despite our problems, and we have serious problems of bureaucracy and inefficiency and the tax system and the like, America remains the most competitive of the world's major economies. Smaller countries like Switzerland, Singapore, Finland, Sweden, and so on lead us. But of the big ones, Britain is, the US is seventh, among all countries. Uh, of the big economies, Britain is number eight, Japan number 10, China number 29, Brazil 48, India 59, Russia 67. Our natural resources are amazing. I could spend the rest of my time on the energy renaissance in oil and gas. You've read about it, so I will simply say it is having an enormous economic resource and technological impact on our society. It's a huge economic stimulus, and it has important foreign policy implications for both our friends and our adversaries. We still have major problems, and I don't want to ignore those. The book that Ephraim holds up includes chapters. Half the book deals with America's problems. I'm certainly not someone who says we don't have problems, but the point I want to emphasize is that of contingency. In other words, America's decline is not, as we say, baked in the cake. There's nothing inevitable about it. We have the kinds of problems I referred to, budget deficits, um, uh, political polarization, um, and things of that sort, as well as economic growth, but those are all things that are resolvable. Some of the most Difficult issues come in the realm of foreign policy, where choices are especially important. Clearly, American leadership in foreign policy in the last couple of years has been, I would say, less effective, 
um, less um, one of leadership than uh, is not only necessary in America's own national interest, but also because the American role is unique. Without America's continued active engagement in the world, there will be less stability, less international order, less prosperity, less human rights, more nuclear proliferation, and the rest. Does the United States have the capacity to play the role it has to play in its own interest and that of its friends and allies, as well as those who uh, count on America? In short, does it have the will? Well, in a nutshell, there have been previous times uh, when America has seemed to lack the will. Think of the 1930s or in August 1941, with Europe already at war for almost two years, the U.S. House of Representatives only renewed draft legislation, conscription, by one vote. The um, public uh, sometimes gets war weary, as it is now, and skeptical of the use of force, as on Syria, but it responds to leadership. And historically, when Americans feel their own interests are seriously at risk, when they feel America is under threat or attack, when they feel that intervention and the use of force is both necessary and just, America will often respond quite decisively. Indeed, sometimes with a ferocity which shocks both its friends and allies. One or two more points and then I'll conclude. The German Marshall Fund does a wonderful study each year, they've been doing it for 12 years, of foreign policy opinion in 10 European countries, Turkey and the US. It's available every year for free online. The latest study for 2013 just came out. They survey all these countries. My favorite question is, is force sometimes necessary to secure justice? In Europe, as you might expect, about uh, three quarters of Europeans say no. In the United States, even now with the weariness of the war and the uncertain trumpet in the White House, the 61% of the American people still think the answer is yes, that force sometimes is necessary. Let me conclude without giving you a firm answer, but to express some optimism, cautious optimism perhaps, but optimism nonetheless. I want to quote uh, Alexis de Tocqueville writing about America in 1835, the great French author, who wrote, quote, the great privilege of the Americans does not consist in being more enlightened than any other nations, but in being able to repair the faults they might commit, unquote. And Winston Churchill, in a much more familiar quote to you, who half a century ago said, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they have exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> Thanks for listening.